doing? Good. 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 All right. I'm Rodney Sampson from Atlanta, Georgia, and excited to be here, excited to meet uh, more of you and to continue the conversation we had in Atlanta. Um, how many of you would agree that we are in very interesting times? <laughs> so I, can get, I can get full snaps on that one in agreement, right? So, um, I've invited some of, uh, I would say, colleagues and actually friends. Uh, actually, three of us are from Atlanta. We rarely see each other in Atlanta because of the work we do. So we had to come to San Francisco uh, to actually uh, see each other. So we're going to have a conversation today about blockchain. How many of you have heard of blockchain? Okay. Uh, cryptocurrency. A little less. Bitcoin, Ethereum, okay. Right. Who's been checking their Coinbase account all night? <laughs> and we're also going to talk a little bit about um, the Jobs Act and equity uh, crowdfunding as well. Um, a little bit about myself, and then we'll have each um, of our esteemed uh, panelists uh, each introduce themselves as well. So I am a native of Atlanta, Georgia. I uh, started my first company in 2000 and was fortunate enough uh, to actually raise a seed round in 2000 and 2001. Um, there were a few of us out there during that time like Clarence Wooten and Omar at Black Planet, you know, black folks in tech. And we all looked up to someone named Emmett McHenry, who you may or may not know. <coughs> Emmett McHenry had the original um, RFP from the federal government to maintain all domain names. He was the original founder of Network Solutions. And Emmett had to raise $3 million to go to market, so he met with the Bob Johnsons of the world, and the Earl Grays of the world, and um, just black influencers, the Captain Hughes of the world. He couldn't raise a dime because no one had a website back then. And so who cares what a domain name is if it doesn't point anywhere? So there was no visual context for people. So anyway, Emmett ended up selling network solutions to get the three million, probably for about 90 plus percent of that business, by the way. So he pivoted from a service to a product company, had to sell 90% because he couldn't raise the capital amongst our community, even its wealthy, its influential, et cetera. The company that bought network solutions then sold it for billions less than two uh, two or three years later, right? So it was a huge, a huge number. Now, I mean, Emmett still owned a piece of the company, and so he became wealthy, but he didn't become a billionaire because he couldn't find 30 black people to give up $100,000, right? Um, and so that provides some context. We looked up to Emmett back then. Um, it was very lonely in those days, the concept of raising capital for a high growth company when most of your colleagues who were in business were either in government contracting, corporate supply, diversity, family owned businesses. And so the concept of building a high growth business for the purpose of actually scaling it and selling it was a very lonely place to exist because everyone thought you were crazy and family didn't understand what you were doing. Why couldn't you just go get a regular job and just, you know, put that degree and all that Sally Mae, you know, you had um, to, to work. Um, and so that's how it was in 2000, 2001, 2002. There was no definitive conversation about blacks in tech. No one was, you know, one was talking about it. Um, and so we come full circle, and now that it has become more of a positive narrative in some regard, um, I look backwards and I say, you know, we really haven't come that far since the early part of, of the century. And so I've um, dedicated um, this part of my life to a concept called ecosystem building, which is essentially building the infrastructure um, and the capacity to help entrepreneurs to actually launch and, and to scale. 
And so I won't bother you with the specifics of that. I'm across the social graph um, on LinkedIn. We can connect there. I have published four books. Uh, latest one, uh, which was four years ago, called King and Omics, 12 Innovative Currencies for Transforming Your Business and Life, inspired by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It's on Audible. Uh, it's not in the stores now because it's not a hot book. Uh, but you can still you know, buy the book on Amazon. The thesis was, I thought, pretty simple, but yet complicated. I studied Dr. King's final years where he had transitioned from you know, civil, uh, the fight for civil and human dignity, and not total because he was dealing with uh, the Vietnam War, but he was focusing more on economic dignity and cooperative economics, which going back a little bit in time, and I'm just laying the stage for this conversation, the Montgomery bus boycott was an example of cooperative economics where we withheld our dollar, but if you also read some of King's writings and some of the critiques, we missed the opportunity because we had created our own shuttle companies and transportation companies, and after we got the right to sit anywhere on the bus, we gave up those businesses. And so it looks like for every milestone that we achieved, even the construct we call you know, integration, there was a trade-off for our economic dignity. We lost businesses, we lost entire communities, and we really haven't um, had a renaissance, per se, in terms of that in, in, in our country. And so the thesis was we can disrupt poverty and the wealth gap by ensuring that socially disadvantaged, which is the technical term, the government term, or underrepresented, I like to say undertapped communities per se, rather than underrepresented, um, gets authentic access to the innovation, entrepreneurship, and investment economy, the economies of, of, of the future. And that if we can close the wealth gap in those communities, then that would disrupt <coughs> um, some of the things that continue to plague our society. And I had this conversation, and I won't belabor it, but I'm going to jump in. Um, I had this conversation with um, Sean King when Michael Brown got killed in Ferguson. And I said, Sean, I'm begging you before you send out the email asking, you know, police departments to do this, uh, buy certain equipment, you know, et cetera, uh, to button up their shops, per se. Will you please send an email to the crowd and ask us to go buy the stock of the companies that will be selling <coughs> that equipment to police departments? not realizing that every tweet, retweet, quote, was driving the valuation of our social media sites. And so as we reacted to, you know, a modern day manifestation of institutionalized racism, internalized racism, personalized racism, etc., that once again we were just pawns in this piece because we were literally creating wealth all around us and not participating in it. And so um, that to me sort of settled it in terms of like, we really got to focus. And then this report came out probably a couple of months ago that by 2053, the average net worth of a black American family will be zero. Today it's about 11,000, you hear these numbers. 13 for um, Latinx America. And then by 2073, Latinx America would be zero. And so the reality of it is, all these fancy social programs and projects, look, none of that shit matters. We're gonna go from 11,000 down to zero. Because we're not doing it at scale. And we're not doing it at a sustainable level of, of scale. And it's like, when your net worth is zero or below zero, then I started doing some research and I said, you know what? Navian, Sally Mae, 
we're coming out of college, graduate school, and PhD programs with terminal degrees mm -hmm. and two, three, four hundred thousand dollars worth of liability of debt. How do we climb? We that means it's going to be a lot of smart black and brown folks with terminal degrees with less than zero net worth. And so, um, yeah, all right. <laughs> so with that being in mind, I wanted to provide that context, a little bit about my personal journey, a little bit about why I believe that inclusive innovation, entrepreneurship, and investment across early exposure, education and training, ecosystem building, and what we're talking about today is literal, literal capital formation that has never existed before in this respective shape or form. And so the buzzwords that we're hearing out there are cryptocurrency and blockchain and crowdfunding and seed rounds and down rounds and private equity and venture capitalists, all of these things. And we are still so nascent in our participation in these wealth, you know, cre literally wealth creation opportunities. For the first time in history because of technology and the opportunity to build a high growth company, you can create multi-generational wealth with no reliance on pre-existing multi-generational wealth. In the past, if you didn't have access to the networks, the connections, and or the resources, the equipment. And we have people, uh, some in leadership positions in this country who minimize the reality that they started with a million dollars that they could have lost and then got it again. And so for the first time in history, and so the world is literally changing and it's changing so fast that even I, as I turned 45 this year, struggle with it creates an anxiety of actually keeping up with the pace of it. And some people would say, well, you've got it figured out. No, it is an anxious space to be in. It makes me feel like how I felt when folks were trying to get me to set up my first MySpace page. And I was like, what are you talking about? Why would I ever do that? And it sounds like with Steve Case, if you ever talk to him, how it took him 10 years to convince people that people were actually pay to want to be on the internet and to even use this thing called that no one would use it. And so we're seeing these different revolutions of parents. So with that context, without further ado, I'd like for each of our esteemed guests to introduce themselves um, with some brevity so that we can then jump into the conversation and then allow for um, questions. I want us to leave here today. I, I don't want just to introduce terms, we can do that. But I really want to talk about how can people start? Like literally, what, what did you do? How can you do that? How can others do it? So they leave this room understanding what a potential path. None of this is a panacea, none of this is a silver bullet. But this is a path that, that some of us have chosen. So I'm going to start with Chris McFarland. Um, and why don't you tell us who you are, tell us why you qualify to talk about blockchain and cryptocurrency and startups. Yeah, sure. Hi everyone. Very glad to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm Chris McFarland, the founder and CEO of Patientory. Um, we're the first healthcare cryptocurrency. We are also the first healthcare initial coin offered. I see you have heard that around town and the first healthcare blockchain. So this past summer, we, uh, our ICO netted $7.2 million in three days. Um, a little background on myself, I was actually pregnant going through college, you know. Born of immigrant parents from the island of Jamaica. It was either you went to med school or you became a doctor. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah, right? Um, decided, you know, you know went, went through college, went to Cornell, um, upstate New York. Um, I don't think your mic is on. Yeah, I don't think it's so. on. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I was introduced, you know, just randomly to the world of digital healthcare, and that was back in 2010, 2011, when we had this initiative from the White House to, you know, to build entrepreneurs that can, you know, build the future of healthcare, especially since it's one of their main industries. 
um, that's bankrupting um, our economy today. So the last startup I led um, <coughs> was insurance space, and we had a you know difficulty getting access to patient data. I was also you know tracking blockchain back in 2010, 2011. It was really early and Bitcoin was worth like $30. Um, but it occurred to me, this is blockchain, this is the future of, of the internet. It's you know high, highly secure um, database mechanisms. Why not attribute it to, to the healthcare industry? And that was my inspiration for starting the company, um, Patient Tory, two years ago. And it's, it's just been a, a great experience. So Rodney is one of my advisors um, to the company. And it's, yeah, so we're currently, you know, deep in developing the infrastructure now. Um, we have a team of, of about 10 people um, based in Atlanta, but also in um, different countries around the world as well. So, well, so a little context as we move down. So, as far as we know, there are three black people on the planet that have raised a successful token sale, right? Yeah. Okay. Two of them are in Atlanta. And so you raised 7.2 million in three days. Yep. I mean, I literally watched you in, in, mm -hmm. in our space do it. Sean from Storage raised 30 million in three weeks. Mm -hmm. And then the guy in London, how much did he raise? I think he was about 15 million. 15 million. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. And we're going to come back and once they introduce themselves, have them like define certain terminology for those who don't know what is blockchain, what is cryptocurrency, etc. Hey everyone, how are you? I'm so honored to be here and thank you all for having me. So, um, my name is Laban King. I'm originally from Detroit, Michigan. You're welcome to Detroit. Hey. Oh, I see you. Um, I am the CEO of an investment firm called Millennial Global Investments. Um, I also just ran for mayor of Atlanta. Uh, did win, but still got my money. <laughs> anyway, so, um, so um, why did you why did you run Laban? Let's, let's well, uh, I ran because um, Atlanta is a well. My mother's side of the family is from Atlanta, so although I'm from Detroit, um, I saw Atlanta before Atlanta became the new Atlanta. I saw the pre-Olympic Atlanta, and um, when you look at Atlanta right now, um, mm -hmm. it's about sixty four percent gentrified. Um, it's the highest wealth gap in the nation. Um, number one when it comes to uh, um, homelessness per capita. Um, if you live in Atlanta and you're in poverty, you have a 4% chance of getting out. Um, I have seen poverty like none other. And you know, being from Detroit, um, when I grew up in Detroit, I saw wealth. You know, don't let anyone fool you. Oakland County for 40, 40 years was the richest county in the nation. Um, it's a suburb right outside of Detroit. So I saw wealth, but I also saw poverty. But in Atlanta, it's, another, it's, it's, a, it's to another level. And so I believe that um, we needed politicians or leaders that had a better um, idea of economics. Um, and I ran against 13 people who were either lawyers or public policy people. And so when the conversation of ec economics came, they didn't really quite understand it. Um, unfortunately, uh, how can I say this without being shady? <laughs> okay. Don't tweet it. Don't tweet it. Don't tweet it. Don't tweet it. Unfortunately, the people that I ran against are about maintaining Atlanta. I was all about pushing Atlanta to the future. And sadly, I don't see that happening right now. So, what I've decided to do was to continue what I'm doing in the private sector, partnering with people like Rodney and some of the other people on the panel and some people that are in Atlanta. Because when it's all said and done, um, people are suffering now. Don't have time for you to go to a bill and do I deny somebody, like people are suffering now. Um, how I came to owning an investment firm, it actually started out with my love for ice cream. So when I was a little kid, um, we just had this little shady ice cream man that would drive down the street really, really fast, seriously. And so we wouldn't have time enough to go and flag him down and like go back to our house and get the money, right? So I said, okay, if you go play on this block, you gotta pay dues. 
and you gotta put your change in the bucket. So when the ice cream man comes, all you gotta do is take the, the, the bucket and run out and I'll buy everybody ice cream. And so I started like an investment ice cream <laughs> company. And I, didn't even, and I didn't even realize that I did it. And so um, I went to the University of Michigan and um, go blue. Yeah, go blue. And uh, studied history. I also worked in the music industry. And it's a full circle moment because when I was a freshman, that young man right there started a record label with some of the best talent. Angela Burchett is one of the best singers in the world, and so is her sisters. And so I was really inspired by what you did, you know, you. being a freshman, seeing you start this record label. And so I ended up starting a record label. I worked for a lot of different artists, this, that, and other. But um, like my grandma said, the purse comes first. So when the music industry started to kind of like dwindle as far as money, I was like, well, let me take my money and go into real estate because my parents had did it on the side as well. And um, I went to Dubai with my best friend. And in Dubai, someone was telling me about um, Bitcoin. Kept on talking about Bitcoin, actually, was my best friend's friend. And the whole trip, I mean, the whole trip, he talked about Bitcoin. Bitcoin, Bitcoin, Bitcoin. And so I was like, this don't make no sense. I'm not going to do it. Just, I didn't understand it. I especially didn't understand the technical aspect of it. So um, we went from Dubai to Egypt. And if you've ever been to Egypt, you'll see like the, 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 uh, the pyramids, like one block is like bigger than me. Like it looks much different in person. And so went back to Dubai. He kept on talking about Bitcoin, Bitcoin. I was like, dude, I'm not interested, yada, yada, yada. So on the way from Dubai back to Atlanta, we hit some horrible turbulence in that area. And I was on that plane, I was at labor. You didn't get on this plane and you don't understand it. Why would you stop from investing in something based upon what you don't understand? So I was like, you know what, when I, when I land, I got the money to waste, this, that, and other. So I'm going to buy some Bitcoin. And so I actually bought it when it was $69 a coin. And um, I bought it. Didn't think anything of it. Um, the funniest thing is I'm a huge Charlie Brown fan, so I didn't even know that it was called blockchain. I kept on calling it blockhead. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm trying to explain to people, like, I got this thing, and it's on the blockhead, and you need to get it. But, um, like I said, I, I, I bought it and didn't really think anything of it. And just, I mean, just to, to be transparent, you know, last night I was at the bar with some people, um, you know, with some of y'all having fun, having intellectual conversation. And I wake up and I'm a million dollars richer now, you know, because it surged. And so um, I would really just encourage people to, yeah. there's, ignorance is a, a multi-billion dollar industry. And so I would encourage you all to not let what you don't understand stop you from making a move in your gut, you know, um, because there is no way, to, I was I was like, if I could just make $150 per coin, I'd be good. I would have never thought that it would be at almost $18,000 a coin right now. You know what I'm saying? So um, that's my story. You just buy one coin. Oh, no, I bought a lot. Yeah. And I can tell you how much because I don't want to get Uncle Sam too excited. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I, 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 I will tell you this. Like, um, I'm just kind of in shock at what it's been you know it's been it's been really remarkable and i and i'm just i'm, I'm grateful that um just i followed my gut you know um i believe at a certain point in order to be successful you have to be willing to lose it all and that's me so that's my journey that's something well, that's hard to follow behind later <laughs> sorry <laughs> okay. you all hear me so, first of all, I cannot top that story in any stretch of imagination. Um, Richard Swart, I'm actually probably in my element here, which is unusual because I'm sort of a policy wonk and do a lot of academic research, and I'm the boring guy on the panel. Um, so, three days ago, I got asked by the Milken Institute to be a senior fellow in the Center for Financial Markets working on financial inclusion, specifically for women of color. I also run a center at UC Irvine and the Institute for Money, Technology, and Financial Inclusion. We're funded by Bill Gates. We study fintech and how it's changing the world. 
89 countries, most of the global south. Uh, my particular optics are around community banking, credit unions, and how we can keep fintech from exacerbating a digital divide and helping to increase access to capital rather than you know, aggregating more wealth to people who already have wealth. And so when I was at UC Berkeley, I used to teach there. with the Institute for Business and Social Impact. So my brain is basically this side is technology and this side is how do we keep it from screwing up the world more, <laughs> to put it in a non-academic sense. Mm -hmm. uh, I met Rodney, I've been working with Rodney for six years, seven years, something like that. And originally, most people know me as the crowdfunding guy. I wrote the World Bank Report on how crowdfunding can affect the world. I chaired a commission for the SEC on industrial protection. I've done a ton of work globally around, including in Egypt, around how crowdfunding can be done, how crowdfunding can change communities, and I'm sort of the crowdfunding wonk. Lately, like everybody else, I've been pulled more into ICOs, cryptocurrencies, tokens. Uh, I want lots and lots and lots of boards and play with lots of companies. I'll give an example of what I want you all to be a part of. One is called Crowd Smart. It's, a, it's, a, it's collective intelligence. You take AI and you marry it to smart humans, the outcome's better. And Crowd Smart is basically angel list with technology, not just a bunch of rich white guys investing behind a bunch of rich white guys, which is basically what angel list is. Um, making a lot of money doing that model, if they always have. But the advantage of CrowdSmart is we're basically a venture capital firm with AI. 21% of our investments go to women. And that may not sound like a lot, but if you know the venture capital industry, it's more like 2%, 1%. Okay, so we're 21% in our model. We hope to get that higher, but AI can't cure all social ills, but it looks like in this particular case, AI is removing the majority of the racial bias and the gender bias. Not all of it, can't ever fix the world, but a lot of it. Part of our technology is we've engineered a diverse pool of human experts, like all of you. So if you are an expert in a particular area like healthcare technology, or finance, or medicine, or whatever your background is, we'd love to have your brain. And we can talk more about what that actually means later. Uh, I'm also involved in a blockchain company very boring, we're going to distribute mid-market debt. Translation, a lot of companies that are growing, they go to the bank and they get the door slammed in their face. Regardless of, basically, if you're not on the coast, pretty hard to get a bank loan. So our company is using the blockchain to distribute debt very efficiently, and we have what's called smart contract technology. Basically imagine a WYSIWYG or a drag and drop um, interface where you can create rules for compliance. If, if you know, Loan officer says this, this has to be certified by this person, this data has to flow here. We design it visually, it's encoded into what's called a smart contract that sits on the blockchain. It decreases the cost of compliance and the cost of issuance by about 99%. IBM says it's the most advanced technology they've ever seen in blockchain. So I'm playing in blockchain, not my technology, didn't invent it, but I'm having fun with it, We're playing with some uh, alternative AI systems, and go to Atlanta and help Rodney when I can. Well, good to have you. Thank, Thank you. you. Jervis. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Jervis. So my background um, isn't that varied. It's actually financial services. So I started my career um, once I, this is, you women got a shout out, uh, since Clemson won the national championship last year. We're going to do that. So when I left Clemson, um, went to Atlanta, and I began with a little small company that started out here in Rancho Cordova that you may have heard of, was E-Trade. Um, E-Trade's still around. I uh, started there and it was interesting. I came out of graduate school and knew I wanted to be in financial services. Um, my mother worked for what is now Progressive Energy. And so when I was a, a kid, I can remember her because of course they had stock options, poor stock options, right? So she would uh, get the paper on Fridays and you know you had that one part where you had all these numbers and it just had high low, close, and this is what it looked like years ago when you just couldn't get that information. It's, you either got it at five o'clock in the afternoon or you got it in the newspaper at the end of the day or on the weekend. So I remember being in third grade and we were learning how to look at newspapers, how to go through everything. And I remember opening up and a teacher, everybody else in the class just talking and going through and I opened to the financial section. And the teacher walks by and she's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm looking at my mom's stop. <laughs> and she, you know, she thought it was the funniest thing, so she, she told the principal, my father was also a principal in the, in the same district, so when I got home that day, he was like, well, you don't own any of it, I don't know why you're looking at it. I'm like, <laughs> but I will, but I will. So that was kind of the beginning of everything. And so, uh, fast forward, um, I worked for what was uh, NASD, 
which was the regulatory agency for NASDAQ. I started my career there. Uh, again, very, you talk about a, an industry where we are not represented at all. It's financial services. Reason being, you know, we can talk civil rights, we can talk human rights, um, and I always say human rights, I don't say civil rights, because I think a lot of times we use it, the term civil rights was given to us in the United States to somehow disassociate our plight with other marginalized people around the world. So human rights struggle. Um, when you look at it, all in all, the last vestige, the last piece that we need to get is the, is the money piece, right? So I always tell people, I'm in financial services basically, uh, basically because I understand that. So again, fast forward, I was at NASD, NASDAQ, um, NASD became FINRA regulatory. So I was basically like a cop. We went out to investment banking firms. We went out to any type of firm. It could be mergers and acquisitions. It could have been uh, just a regular retail firm. But we were the people that went in and did the audits, quasi-governmental, uh, just to make sure they weren't taking money and doing you know crazy things. Crazy things. It was the same company that missed uh, that missed made actually missed made off. And I'll fast forward to a story about that. Um, so for the last eight years, I have either worked for minority investment banking firms. I actually started my own consulting firm, which I still have, and I still do a lot of work for other smaller uh, investment banks uh, on the compliance side where I'll go in and do their books, uh, look at their business models, do some business development for them. I love it. It's, it's what I do. So about seven years ago, I think I met Rodney and, and Richard. So at the time, um, one of my clients actually asked me to become the CEO of the company. So one of the reasons I'm up here is that from a crowdfunding perspective, uh, I was the first CEO of what is now Jumpstart Securities, but if anybody knows crowdfunding, they know Fund America. It was originally Fund America. So when Scott Purcell was one of the early innovators with the internet, um, and that's literal, I used to always get on him about that on his Wikipedia page, right? But I'm like, you really have that. You were found like, you can't do that, Scott. That's not, but when you really look at it, he did have a lot to do with some of the some early adopting of some of the, um, some of the technology. So what happened was we were sitting around one day, and this is when I knew things were different. We were putting together the technology, which later became Fund America Technology. We were sitting there at his place in Vegas. Keep in mind, he'd had like a $60 million exit when he was like 39 in another company back in the day. Um, so he has this really nice, but it's, you know, nice little house in, 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 uh, in Vegas. We're sitting there, you know, Scott. So, and he's like, um, how much do you think we're gonna need to implement this technology? And I'm like, I don't know. Um, we're done building now, what do you wanna do? So you think a million to do it? Like, I don't need that much. You know, just bootstrap it, we don't need that. He was like, well, cool. Um, we had another partner in the business. He was like, we'll just go ask his dad for, for 1.8. This is the moment in life when you have the aha moment, like, where I'm from, we can't do that. And he legitimately said, tomorrow, we'll just go ask him for it. I'm like, okay, whatever. Later on that night, he actually makes the phone call. He's like, yeah, just, we need you to wire, you want me to send a check, how do you? I'm like, you, you are shitting me, like, for real? We're sitting there having business. You gonna call somebody else's father? He just gives the money like that. And he did. Uh, next thing you know, it's in crunch base, and I'm looking like this wasn't even a real capital raise. Like I did the, I did the documents for it. Again, I have a compliance background, so I did all that. So when you start looking at it again, as we start talking about cryptocurrency, as we start talking about blockchain, more so anything the value add I want to give to the conversation is just what it means for the, uh, the democratization of capital and what it means to us for us to really have to understand that right now we're in a space where we've never been before. When, when Obama and his administration gave us the Jobs Act. You basically had a situation where those rules hadn't been changed since the early 30s. When people talk friends and family around with credit investors, you just went over what the average household income was. That means you don't know anybody's got 250. I mean, I did because I know a bunch. I know some athletes and some entertainers that could have given me money, but not as a kid, not at 21 years old. So, with that being said, like I said, what I want to be able to talk about here is is that piece of it. So as we go on to speaking about the blockchain and um, some of the pieces of cryptocurrency and some of the other things, that's what well, I hope to be able to add to the conversation. So. I think we're good. All right, thanks for those introductions. Um, our timekeeper, we're going to make sure we're, on, we're 30 minutes in. What are we? 20, Almost 40. Almost 40. All right, so we got, let's go, let's go through a quick terminology. I don't want to assume and I'm going to kind of ask questions as if I were a non-accredited retail um, investor and um, how many how many people know what an accredited investor is um, only Jervis give us a quick definition of an accredited investor 
So I'll give you a very quick, especially $250,000 net worth. Um, and there's some, there's some things that you can do. Um, so you can have some passive income. It really is two, just keep 250 in mind. If you are a finance professional, I'll just change the rules where you could be actually a credit investor from a money standpoint. 250, I think, for a household. Um, so you change, just change 200,000 individual. individual. 300,000 for a second of two years of income and or 1 million in net worth that does not include your primary home. Yep. Actually, so we're talking policy. Before Dodd-Frank, it could include your home. And then post Dodd-Frank, Dodd-Frank it could. So the 400,000 African Americans in this country that are considered to be high net worth, so 1% of black America has a net worth over a million dollars, disproportionately a lot of that is in a home that was impacted by the 2008 um, um, economic downturn. And so those who have the legal ability to invest um, beyond the initial 35 investors in a seed round. And so funding, we're talking about startup funding for those building high growth companies to get that first 250 or a million, um, that's what the SEC has those those, those, those res respective rules. So that's the difference between everybody else that doesn't have that million dollars or that income is considered a non-accredited investor and has limited access to invest in start up businesses that may have the potential to, you know, to grow and scale. And the Jobs Act, Jumpstart Our Business Startups Act signed April 5th, 2012 by President Obama was one of the most bipartisan, actually, pieces of legislation. Off the record, it was said that the president at the time said it was the most influential piece of legislation for African Americans outside of the Emancipation Proclamation for the Southern Slaves. And just to add, because he mentioned um, the wealth that happened in 2008 when the recession happened, 64% of black wealth was lost during the recession. 64%. And so, that accredited investor uh, number is down a lot in this country. And so I think it's a, a point. Like I started an organization called the New Black Wall Street Movement, but our, our legal name is United Economic Development Council of America. And within one year, uh, we have a, a little bit over 100,000 people in the organization. And um, that's because I put that face, but I put it wrong. But, um, what we've been able to do is to help people with their credit. You know, the goal is to try to get people to start off, you know, focusing on their credit at 750 and higher. Um, a lot of people don't understand credit is king. You know, if you, if you have great credit, you kind of got the keys to, um, well, put it like this. Every wealthy person has good credit. It's the foundation for wealth, for the most part. Um, and so that's the goal. And, and we also are doing other things to get people to be accredited. but just. The fact that people don't even know what that definition is, we have to be able to educate people with that. Thank you, Bob. All right, next definition. First, what is the blockchain? That's a good question. Everyone wants to know what the blockchain is. Um, in simple definition, it is a distributed database, um, a ledger that where you can basically store and release transactions. Um, and you can apply it to any industry. So that's and that's where we see, you know, this past year we've seen um, more industries start to adopt and pilot the use of blockchain technology, especially because it also solved the issue of double spend, um, where if you s transact, if you send a transaction from point A to point B, you don't have to worry about it, you know, being taken out of that account a second time. Um, so that's one of the, the miracles of blockchain and, and why it, it has such you know, great implications in the financial industry, um, but looking down the line into supply chain, um, healthcare, um, and other use cases. So, so the basis of Bitcoin, since it's the most, one of the most popular primary currencies, and we'll talk about what a token is next, is the actual technology that it is built on, which is blockchain. And the path to building blockchain technologies currently, because it's constantly evolving, would be if you are a uh, database developer, if you're a Java developer or a Python developer, and then you learn a new framework called Solidity. So Solidity for the computer science folks or the coders in the room 
is where actual blockchain technology um, is being created. So when you look at from a policy perspective, you look at workforce and WIOA and the types of training for the types of jobs of the future, if we're not able to train people in those skills, then we also won't be uh, the developers in, in, in the industry in, in getting those respective jobs. It was brought up last evening is that it, it seems like there's a lot of uh, pre-existing and current uh, white supremacist uh, institutionalized racist ideas in tech, <coughs> i.e. like the James you know, DeMore thesis that came out of that developer, um, these new technologies are also harboring these people who also have these ideas. You know, the deeper, the, the more traction we get in tech, the deeper they go into the technology. And the deeper they go into the technology, the more of the infrastructure that they actually um, control. And so we have to be also mindful in terms of actually some of us in the room have to be advocates for learning the skills to actually build the technology. The two primary, uh, when I, well, you, some of the main use cases of blockchain technology is secure transaction, you know, sending transactions back and forth securely, and then storage of data. And now even though blockchain is being hacked because the developers are getting smarter, they're using AI, artificial intelligence, machine learning, they're using that to actually hack. It is harder to hack. Like, Equifax should have been on blockchain technology, mm -hmm. right? Core data in this nation that we consider secure, like in health, HIPAA data should be on blockchain. And what I've come to realize, just looking at it, the entire internet is being rewritten on blockchain. So like, if you're building a tech company today and you're talking about it's on Node.js, like, you know, Google's primary stack is like React Native, Joe, Node.js, like, in the future it will be irrelevant. And so. Those developers are learning solidity now to keep an edge on the actual programming stack that's, that's required. Do you want to add to that? This 30 second pitch here. <coughs> Anyone know the name Don Tapscott? No. Yeah. Anybody? All right. Look up TED Talk about blockchain. It's the most popular TED Talk ever in the history of TED Talks. It's on blockchain by Don Tapscott. He'll explain it for 10 seconds or less. Um, Don's a good friend of mine. He says more wealth will be created in the next decade because of blockchain than the entire history of internet technology. For me, the next decade, there are trillions with a T of wealth to be created through blockchain applications. If you're not in that stream, you're gonna miss out. So blockchain, all right. And this is for anyone up here. What is a primary, what, what is Bitcoin, Ethereum, and like anyone. He made money. He should be he talking about it. <laughs> well, um, those are the three main cryptocurrencies that uh, <coughs> exist. Um, if you have a Coinbase account, those are the three that are on there. There are tons of cryptocurrencies out there. Um, it's almost a new one every day, but really they all go back to those three. Um, Bitcoin was kind of the first, so that's why it's the most popular. Um, my personal opinion is that Ethereum is better, but um, you know, it's it just kind of depends on you know what you like. I think Ethereum is more so of a token, right? It's both. Yeah. So Ethereum is both a currency and a token, and the difference between a currency and a token is a currency, it's like cash, like the U.S. dollar, you know, um, the euro. Um, which Bitcoin is just straight cash. And then Ethereum has a utility to it. So this is where we see a lot of the blockchain companies, you know, using the Ethereum infrastructure to build on top of that um, and also create their own token. So our healthcare token, PTOY, is built on Ethereum. Whereas we, would, we wouldn't have been able to do that just on like the, block, the Bitcoin <coughs> infrastructure. So, so literally with no, like, you didn't have to go to FINRA, you didn't have to go to the, Federal Reserve Board uh, to establish new monetary policy to issue a token. You literally had an idea, ideated around a software product that solves a big problem, which is kind of like the thesis for high growth company building. And then you created literally, we, I mean, it's not a company, you literally create your own currency. Like, it has value to it. It has value, but it's legally, not it has its value, but legally it's not a currency like the dollar. And so as a, as a utility though, when I look at like our traditional stock market and how it fluctuates based upon affinity and or fear, right? You know, there 
factors that in, in, um, influence the market, when your token first came out, it was like at a dime. And now it's like up at 60 cents. Why is that, like, why is that value there? Yeah, so I guess the premise on, you know, a lot of these currencies that are that are being issued on a daily basis is, you know, what are they trying to solve? Um, similar to how investors with a VC company would do due diligence on a startup company. Now we see it as an open market where anyone can look at a project and say, oh, this is great, I want to invest in it. Um, so we see from, you know, different people all over the world once they find interest in a project, they invest their tokens in it, they become supporters of the project, and that also, that has some speculative value. But once the, the, the infrastructure is there, the utility of that token is the fuel for that blockchain, and as more people use it, the value goes up, which is why Bitcoin has skyrocketed in like the past couple of days. I think one of the other things, like I said, from a capital market standpoint, when you look at uh, regular companies that, that IPO on an exchange, the one thing that I think people overlook is the fact that the currencies themselves are set. So as far as the amount issue, mm -hmm. so you have basic economic supply and demand, you've got a fixed amount. So what you see with Bitcoin is scarcity, knowing that there can be no, what was the, what was the amount that was actually? 23 million so is like the exact amount. Yeah. So that's so that's so that's what's there. Whereas with a company, if you know anything about how the stock market works or how capital structure with a company works, uh, you know you can have you can authorize shares. You can put shares in the float. You can go do a registration statement, register some more shares, and dilute the crap out of everybody else who already has it. So that's something that you don't have in this particular piece. So with that set fixed amount, and now um, I know they're about to do futures. So, uh, well, let me take it back. They're going, they, they want to do futures. Supposedly, they're, they're supposed to go up on the 18th. In Chicago. Yeah, so Chicago, so CBOE and CME may do it. Even though I did see right on the way before Ryan and I jumped into Uber, that some of the big banks were looking to block. It was a lift. I'm sorry. I said that. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my bad. <laughs> my bad. Um, that's hilarious. Uh, but yeah, so so some of the major banks. So I think one of the other things to, to look at, I think one of the biggest pieces uh, for me as being a former regulator is how, you know, Jamie Dimon was one of the first people that came out and said, oh, it's a fad, it's, it's, it's a scam, I don't know how it's going to work. And the next thing you know, they're embracing it. He's putting money into it. They bought like $70 million the next day. Right? So they were like, it's yeah. bad, don't Everybody do it, it's down. a fraud. And then you push the price down. And they treat it as like new gold, right? Yeah. So, so with those things being said, I think it's going to be interesting because I will tell you right now, if they pull off the thing where they're going to do futures on Bitcoin, you're going to see it go up even more. It's going to be that's that's what's going to that's going to be the next jump that it makes if they don't find a way. And, and the thing about it, I hate to be, uh, you know, I hate for the, the cynicism to come out. But one thing about the U.S. is that we like to regulate ourselves sometimes out of being competitive, or regulation will be written in such a way that on the surface people can't tell what's really going on behind the scenes. There's a reason that we have oligopolies. There's a reason that certain things happen. If you look at the stock market crash uh, in, in the 30s, they tell you that it was because of margins and some other things. But a lot of things that happened way before then so they can get into consolidation, right? So, and that's not being a conspiracy theorist. That's actually what happens when you look back at history. So I think what's gonna be the interesting thing here is that no matter what, I think it's at a baseline level where it's gonna be, money's gonna be locked in. But if the regulation can stay fluid around any of the cryptocurrencies, we're going to be fine. I mean, you're going to see some huge, because the first futures uh, deal works for Bitcoin. And they can start doing some more. You're going to see a whole list of futures market, uh, of listings in the futures market that you're going to be able to do. And that's going to, the demand is going to drive up. So, you know, we, we are living in a time where, you know, it is worth the, the shot, the shot to go ahead and, and do it, you know, if you see something that you like, that you should actually go ahead and, and you know, it's never too late. You're still going to get that percentage change where it makes make some money. So let's, uh, and then we can kind of redirect the context and we'll, we'll open it up for some, some, some questions. So, um, you know, I'll kind of put my individual and um, company investing hat on. Um, so, I'm a, you know, this opportunity to help in this Textual Labs, and at Textual Labs, we went out and raised a $15 million seed fund that invests in technical founders. Right now, we have 26 portfolio companies valued on paper at about a billion dollars, do 75 million a year in revenue, 
and created 750 jobs. And then two weeks ago, one of our portfolio companies, who were early investors in storage, which is a uh, you know, cryptocurrency, uh, a blockchain company, uh, they, we put 100,000 in it. Sean, uh, you know, sends us an email and is like, we have 30 years of runway. And Morgan, you can appreciate this, right? Those who are looking at their monthly burn with people, employees, do I go sell around, will we become, raise around, will we become profitable? You know, as an early stage investor, if they don't close that next round and start generating revenue, it's like money down the tubes, it's just gone. And we get a, we get a, like a letter, like we have 30 years of runway. And it's like, I'm now looking at like, okay, this one company, we don't have to worry about the pressure of raising a follow-on round. Um, means, you know, up it, be further diluted just so we live for another day. And I know there's a lot of conversation about access to capital in, in, our, in, our, in, our, conversa in, our, in our community because for the life of me, I can't understand why philanthropy and, you know, those who say they want to, you know, disrupt, you know, poverty and wealth, yada, 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 yada in our communities, the only financial products they create and push are debt products. Mm -hmm. Yet $85 billion a year goes to mostly upperly mobile white males. And when they say women, they're really saying white females, right? To be clear. And so when we look at truly how do we build our businesses, and I'm seeing how fast these companies are able to raise capital. And I think now we can kind of move into the part I get excited about is we can build a reactive movement to respond to someone being killed in the street. But can we build a proactive movement so that when you go to school or you learn a skill and you decide you want to be an entrepreneur, whether it's a social entrepreneur or whether it's a high growth technology company, that your spirit is not crushed because 500 people who call themselves investors tell you no. Because we can party together, whether we're going to our conclaves or boulets, but we can't pool money together. <laughs> Policy-wise is, you know, when we have tried, we've been called Ponzi schemes, right? And our brilliant, disruptive minds are hauled off to jail and everyone is saying, we told y'all they wouldn't do nothing. Or we see our communities disrupted with, you know, you know, look at Black Wall Street, and look at Auburn, and look at all the, the communities, right? So I think the opportunity is to embrace this, at least become knowledgeable about it. Like what we've been talking up here is kind of the science of the industry. But when you talk the science of your industry, you feel really good about that. Whether it's policy formation, whether it's social justice, whether it's economic justice, education, however you frame your narrative. And I guess we get excited about it because we see glimpse. Like what Krista has done is a glimpse of what could be. It's not enough to have one black female founder, the only black woman on the planet who's ever raised a successful token sale and raise the amount of money that you do. But the reality of it is, each and every one of us in this room could have invested as little as $100, $200. I would go to say, and she doesn't know all of them, but the majority of the investors in her company are not black. So when we do raise capital, and you hear about our startups that raise money, every time you hear around close, if that's not black or brown dollars, guess what? Wealth leaves the community. Every time an outside investor invests on the cap table, which is basically the ledger of ownership, because if that company is acquired for 100 million or 500 million and a billion, and that founder only now owns three, five, seven, ten percent, ninety percent of that wealth is still leaving the community. And so we have to participate in the opportunity to own early in these companies. And so whether it's equity crowdfunding or whether it's crypto investing or buying tokens, we owe ourselves the ability 
um, to do that. So real quickly, yeah. before we open up questions, where do I go and buy Bitcoin, Ethereum? Ethereum. Where, okay, I'm gonna let you tell us that and then tell us where they can buy P tor <laughs> where they can buy your token. So where do we go buy the stuff that you buy? <laughs> Well, like uh, right now, what do we do? Well, the, the best um, way that I would recommend people is to do Coinbase. Um, it's, that's what I did a uh, long time ago. Um, there's uh, Airbiz, you can do it on that. Uh, there's a few other. It's, and those, the Coinbase is called what? That's an exchange. It's an exchange. Yeah, an exchange. An exchange. Yeah. So basically you um, connect your bank account. Um, to it and then you can just like transfer your money from the bank and if you want to cash it in you can transfer it there or whatever but the one thing about coinbase let's say for instance you buy um okay because but let me make something clear one bitcoin right now is like eighteen thousand. you don't have to have eighteen thousand dollars to get a bitcoin you can get right. parts of a bitcoin and so let's say for instance you buy let's say fifty dollars worth right now because it's fluctuating the your value will actually go up so you might have fifty right now Perfect example, let's say last night, you put $50 in. Right now, you probably have about a good maybe $58. So, you know, it's kind of going up as, as, as the market um, um, goes over Bitcoin as well. So. Now, do you have a strategy for, well, I actually know the answer to this. So, basically, you just put your 25 in and just let it sit. You have never touched it. I've only taken $500 out and that's because I like had some issues. But, uh, so at the wine thing tonight, you take some wine off like you should. Oh no, Google's paying for that, right? No, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't get that much. But um, yeah, but so what happened was basically, I well, and the funniest thing is, I literally set it and forget it. Like, I forgot my password, and <laughs> coin, don't forget your Coinbase password, because they're going to put you through the ringer to get that back. And it just, it kept growing. And to be honest, I, okay, because I invested it in April of 2000 and 13. I really didn't start checking it back until about December of last year. So I just randomly go on my Coinbase and I'm like, bless God. Like, you know, so. <laughs> 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 How do we buy tokens? And then we're going to open it up. Yeah. 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 Um, so like he said, Coinbase is the U.S. cryptocurrency exchange as well as Bitrix, B-I-T-T-R-E-X dot com. So they're the second U.S. Um, based exchange there in Seattle, and that's where you can also buy P-Toy and Bitcoin, a lot of the other alternate currencies. Bitrix. Can you repeat Bitrix? I Bitrix. think you forgot to spell it. Oh, it's B-I-T-T-R-E-X, Bitrix Exchange. Gotcha. Okay, let's open it up for questions. Her. No questions. <coughs> Hi, uh, my name is Jorge. Uh, I am an entrepreneur and uh, marketing strategist and also an adjunct professor of Bard MBA's School of um, Sustainability. And one of the concepts that you're discussing um, or introducing at least is um, the idea of e exploiting the equity crowdfunding mechanism to create wealth. I want to dig deeper into this because I feel like I've gone to church here. There's a little public theology around finance and how to create some maybe moral capitalism <laughs> um, through equity crowdfunding. Can you go a little bit deeper into um, what do you mean by uh, we no longer need capital in order to create capital as a result? So I'll, 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 I'll put my it head on for a minute and uh, socialize this philocostal. Uh, yeah, context, I feel it. I feel it. Right? Uh, I might even raise a crypto offer. Right. <laughs> <laughs> a, a money line, right? Right. Uh, Jamal got hurt out of that. Um, they, they, I'll say an adage. It's a scripture, but there's an adage that says a man or woman that does not leave an inheritance to their children's children is worse than an infidel. It is not even a defined construct. Because usually infidelity is, you know, folks hooking up. You know, folks cheating on one another. Infidelity has a sexual context, but I think we miss the point of infidelity. If you go to that particular, you know, scripture, the scripture's taking it balance. I'm, I'm, I'm talking in an isolated context right now that a man or woman that does not leave an inheritance to their children's children is worse than an infidel. And so I'll go a little bit further and say, like, 
might be unique in this room, but like to only go to school, to get a job, to have a house and have a car, to be a socialite and have status and pontificate, that in itself is living beneath our privilege. And that, that in itself, you know, everyone wants to focus on is that a sin, is that a sin, is that a sin, you know, I think to not leave an inheritance to your children's children is a selfish sin. Mm -hmm. And so whatever mechanism you decide to choose, whether it is equity crowdfunding, whether it is cryptocurrency, whether it is startup investing or working at a startup or advising a startup, that the path to multi-generational wealth and context is not just for the sake of having money. I don't think we can relax as a community to have money just for the sake of having money when you know there are probably 10 people in your family that would die tomorrow and you have to pass the hat to bury them with dignity. So don't tell me you financial in your sorority or your fraternity and y'all still passing the hat to bury folks. And I'm supposed to respect you. And I pledged a fraternity 26 years ago and I have this conversation that we can party together, but can, we can't even extend economic dignity to one another. And so to me, poverty in this country is the sin of racism and the sin of classism, but we are participating in our own demise by not making it a point to learn how to build each other up. Making money is not dirty. The love of money may be, but making it and using it for that goal. So now the equity crowdfunding, we've been tithing. I saw the stat that came out last week. Since integration, the black church has collected $240 billion. $240 billion. That could educate every five-year-old black and brown child in this country with a four-year terminal degree at the equivalent of a state school South, I mean state school tuition, right? And so we have edifices that we open once a week, underutilized buildings. And so if you think about that, we've been crowdfunded with no accountability. So to tell me I'm gonna invest, you know, if we could have invested, it's one thing to read Blavity every day, but it's another thing if we could have invested in Blavity. Now I have a, I have a vested interest in ensuring that the company is successful. If she fails, guess what? Failure is not fraud. Because white folks fail twice before they get it right. <laughs> Us, we are ostracized from our communities for trying to build something and create jobs for people. So I think we need to take that concept of tithing and offering and hold back, I'm not even gonna get into consumerism and what we wear and what we spend to look good. We'll go to Vegas but we won't even say, I'll take a risk into the unknown unknown. So, Rodney, we're getting really, really tight yeah. on time. Okay. And I want to at least try to get two questions if we can. So let's have people ask questions and then all right. have you all answer. Sorry, everybody. I got excited. <laughs> <laughs> so perfect. My question or just comment yeah. question is about risk. I mean, that's, I think, the barrier. There's absolutely the cultural concerns that you address. But look, I can give somebody a hundred dollars, maybe on a good yard, give them a thousand. But if I lose that, I don't have another thousand to replace it. And so I wanted some maybe suggestions or strategies when we're thinking about investing. There's all these different types of currencies. Are there hedge? Uh, are there index funds? Are there ways for us to mitigate the risks? Because maybe that would kind of lower the barrier for us to to enter the market. Can we do a two-minute answer. Real quick, so risk you have to diversify. So this gets back into traditional asset allocation. So if you're going to, and it, it all depends on the individual, right? So everybody has a different risk profile. Your personal risk profile is what you have to be willing to kind of take complete loss on. So you work in reverse. This is what I always tell people: What are you willing to completely lose? If you are going to go to Vegas, are you willing to lose a thousand, five thousand, or whatever? You take that piece, then you 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 basically parcel it out. So if you're going to look at cryptocurrency into you, you think that's a huge risk. And you're not a you're risk averse. You're not really the kind of person who wants to take a lot of risk. That's a smaller part of your portfolio. You start talking about exchange traded funds and things of that sort. You may put those on the other end, but if they're equity, that means they're going to have more volatility. If you go into fixed income, which is debt bonds, that's going to have less. So you put a mixture of all of that into a portfolio. Like you're talking about not watching. I have a Motif investing account. I've got about 360, well not about. I have 368 positions in that account. And the reason I have 368 positions because I can just let it go. 
I can just let, unless I get an email to say, and I have no triggers on that, but it's completely all over the place. So at the end of the day, I want it to mimic the market and maybe beat the market a little bit. I just don't want it to lose. It's about preserving capital sometimes as much as it is about making a bunch of money. We always hear the good stories about the upside, but just like try, people trying to get into the NFL or NBA, for all those upside stories, you got a lot of people who lose everything they have. So you have to diversify that out and only take as much risk as you can bear at that particular time. This is risk, this is the risk capital, all of this startup investing, yeah. cryptocurrencies token, like only invest what you can lose. And, and and the one thing, just think about this too, and I hate to be this blood, most folks lose it anyway. So it's like I don't want to lose but you lose it anyway. Because when you don't play, you're losing. Yeah. And 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 I think that it's just at a point in which you really have to take that 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 risk and it just be like you know listen as long as you got breath in your body you can recover that's how i look at it you know i'm i know what i got in my head i can't lose that you know god willing and so with that being said i know i can just bounce back so we have two we have two minutes left so let's get this next question uh, now that the dollar is no longer backed by gold how do you think cryptocurrency is going to affect physical currency? And at what point is the government going to say, hey, we want our tax dollars from what's going on? They're already doing that. Yeah. yeah. Like they, I, I know recently they just, um, I believe it was Coinbase, they just asked for like, you know, 10,000 10, records of people. So I might see me on the news, I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> but you know what? Pay your taxes. Yeah, pay your taxes. You know, just, just pay the taxes. Yeah. If, you, if you invest 25000 and you make five, like, just but even though it's a capital gains tax, if you like, so the, the problem is people don't know the tax code is so broad. Mm -hmm. There's something in it that you can win. You just gotta know what to do and and, and, and how to kind of follow. You can't go to H and R Block, you know, with with Miss Ann who only you know <laughs> do it every you know other year. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So you gotta have the right people that are advising you, right CPAs, that right team that will help you once you build this well, be able to, to do the right thing with it. And cryptocurrency is technically a commodity. I know some people are going to disagree with me on that panel, panel about that. I do. Yeah, it's, it's a commodity. It's not fiat. Because, because again, it's fixed. That's why we have M1, M2, M3 money supply where you can go up and go down if you believe in Kennedy and monetary economics independence. But that's, it's fixed. So based on that, I love, I love financial nerd talk. We'll go ahead. Yeah, time is up. So, uh, Rodney, since it's your panel, if you want to do the 30 second close. You can't withdraw from an ecosystem that you don't invest in and learn about these laws, learn about these currencies, and, and do something. Be a participant at some level so that you don't look back and say, you know, I wish I would have or I, I could have. And we're on this journey together. Uh, we don't have it all figured out. You know, the balance between you know, social, moral, economics, and just you know, capitalism, all that stuff. I know we've had some conversations in this room about that. The balance is the key to all things, and we don't have the answers to that. I just know that if we can get people, $400 is the amount that couples get divorced over. $400 a month. We arguing over $400. If we can just solve that, or just to have the premium to pay our universal whole life life insurance policy, just so we don't lose the policy so we can pay it forward. Maybe this is what gets you that $400, $500, $600 a month. And so look at it from that perspective and just embrace it, even if you don't fully understand it. And we hope to create tools and platforms and different things that we're working on to help you on that journey. Thank you. All right.